Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Glenn. Good to see you. And you. This is Glenn Lowry. This is The Glenn Show. Uh, and I'm with Stephanie Lepp, and she's an old friend. We did a radio thing together a long time ago. She interviewed me about a memoir that's still in progress. I'm almost embarrassed to say. Let's not talk about that, Stephanie. Okay, that's, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> we won't go and, there. And uh, Nathaniel, her husband, who is a Brown alum and uh, was in my class years and years ago when I taught a criminal justice class at Brown. It was just a great group of kids, I want to call them. They're fully grown people with children now. <laughs> <laughs> like Ariel <laughs> Werner and uh, yeah. Raheem Brooks. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they were just some really cool people. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah, Stephanie and I did something together. We're here at the Glenn Show. We're talking. Stephanie, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So hello, listeners of The Glenn Show. Yeah, I am. I'm the executive producer at the Center for Humane Technology. I work with Tristan Harris. Some of you may be familiar with our work from um, from the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. Um, yes, I am also a former interviewer of Glenn's. Um, I, I, I used to produce a podcast called Reckonings, um, which told the stories of people who had radically transformed their political worldviews, uh, transcended violent extremism, people who had made basically all kinds of transformative change. And I did a two-part episode with Glenn, um, partly because your story is so fascinating. Um, and you. there's just so much in there to learn about how, how we take a look in the mirror and grow from what we see, you know, just simply. Um, but but we also did a two part because um, yeah because you were working on this memoir that we're not going to talk about um, and so you were and so you were actively in this in the process of looking in the mirror um, and so and yeah and I guess I should also mention before we dive in you know by way of introducing myself yes I do consider you an old friend and um, and I care about you and I you know I like I you taught my husband and a lot of his friends at Brown. And I know there was some sweetness there around it being, I think it was at the beginning of your time at Brown and it was, they are a special class. I'm a little biased. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I care. I, I come with, I come to you today. I care about you and I care about your project really of, of, of helping Lawrence. us. Andrew Morantz is his guest. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm very in touch with Andrew and Ariel and all of these people. So um, they they will enjoy listening to this conversation. <laughs> um, okay, well, I mean, you say, but, Stephanie, hmm. you say you care about me. It almost sounds it, like you're worried about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it's, I, um, I'm sure maybe I am a little worried about, it's more that I'm, I, I believe that you, have maybe more potential to help us in this moment than is currently being fulfilled. And my crazy idea is that I can help you um, fulfill your potential to help all of us. Well, I can say this, it's certainly possible. I mean, we'll talk about my potential and how I'm not yet fully realizing it. But I, I know I learned from you the last time we had deep conversation. I, I can think of a couple of things that I learned. In a way, The Enemy Within, which was uh, not yet the title of my book, I was calling it Changing My Mind. Wasn't I calling it Changing My Mind? I, I don't remember, actually. Yeah. I think I was trying to call it Changing My Mind. And we're talking about the book, which we're not supposed to talk about. Right. Now, now I'm calling it The Enemy Within. And I think that kind of came out of, out of our uh, venture. Yeah. But the other thing that's really important that I learned was that I saw sabotage on the uh, Reagan appointment. Reagan. Uh huh. You know, it, it wasn't yeah. like just something that befell me. It was something that I inflicted upon myself. Right. Uh, because I, you know, I didn't really want to give up the way that I was living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, let's see. I'm I'm wanting to maybe start with a big question and just see where it takes us. So the question I'm just going to pose to you here is I'm, I'm curious what you see as your goal as a public intellectual, as someone, as an influential public intellectual, 
what, how would you articulate what you are trying to achieve? And to what extent are you achieving that? Okay. That's a good one. I mean, you know, it's an opportunity for self-presentation. You, you invite me to engage in a kind of fiction, a kind of construction of what I think people should hear from me when answering that question. But if I'm to be honest with myself, see, because I know the first thing that came to my uh, tongue was I'm trying to change the zeitgeist. I'm trying to get the conversation reoriented. I, I'm trying to counteract a drift in the tenor of the discussion by recentering and, you know, words like that. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And I know that's, I know that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you admit I mean, it. I know at least that you're my real motives it. are real motives are much more. You know, they're like insecurity. <laughs> they're like uh, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. <laughs> uh, they're like self aggrandizement, self love. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I like the sound of my voice. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, I I'm performing. And I like the limelight. You know, I, I'm a contrarian because, I mean, I've gotten very, very comfortable yeah. in, in the kind of distancing and then kind of cross-cutting. Well, and you're congratulated for it. You're celebrated for it, right? Well, I'm pretty so, good at it. Yeah, you're good at it. And, <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah, but I guess now that we're having this conversation um i mean at a deeper level i mean i could say could i really honestly say i want black people to do better i want I'm, you know the well-being of my people i'm kind of a, a nationalist with a small n you know i mean a kind of ethnocentric kind of thing of uh you know <clears throat> struggle but it's not, it's not a sharp edge political struggle. It's more like self-actualization for our people. But uh, as I say it, the words don't really ring true to me, you know, so. Well, um, I mean, even if we just keep your focus on the zeitgeist, let's say, um, I, I, I mean, I, I believe there is some truth to that, but that is something you care about, that you care about shifting public discourse, right? But, um, you know, the last time we spoke, you said you're not interested in persuading. And, and I guess I just, it's like, how can you shift public discourse without persuading? I mean, unless, you know, because there's a lot of minds that would need to change. Well, and so then, of course, that begs the question, how do people change their minds, which is, of course, the topic of reckonings. But, um, yeah, I mean. Why would I say something to you like um, I'm not interested in persuading because I'm angry and I'm tired? Yeah. I don't think people are listening and, and it makes me kind of become diffident and, you know, kind of I'm shrugging. I'm kind of like, I'm distancing myself from it. I'm kind of like, you know, you fools, go on and march over the cliff. Go on, march over the cliff if you insist. I'm damn, you know. And, yeah. and, and I'm giving up. I'm, and, I, and, and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I'm, I do have to fight against it. I mean, it may be that the battle is already lost on that front because uh, I'm not crediting my counterparts with... Uh, capacity to change <laughs> i don't respect them I, you know mm. I, I almost don't want them to agree with me which is terrible <laughs> mm. because then you wouldn't get to you know yeah. be your then they wouldn't be fighting. idiots anymore yeah yeah <laughs> and we could all just go home <laughs> yeah i mean it you but you know this glenn i mean this isn't i imagine this is not the first time you're having these thoughts well, where it comes, because I just had my office hours not long before, just an hour and a half before our conversation, my office hour for today ended, and my students are writing papers. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, they like me, but they're like, you know, 
structural racism, for example, okay? They really, many of them, really believe in structural racism. I mean, you know, don't I know what all the generations of, you know, mistreatment of black people has done in terms of this or in terms of that? And I'm not writing them off. You know, we engage in conversation. I don't agree, but th their sincerity can't be denied and their openness. And, you know, they're looking to me for, for gu guidance, for insight, you know? Mm -hmm. So th that's one area where I haven't given up on persuading. I'm, I mean, I, I kind of don't fight. I mean, I don't say no, no, no. Right. I just kind of say, well, you know, there are a couple of things you might want to consider, but I respect your point of view and you put it very well, you know. Right. Well, you're, you're in a teacher, teacherly mode. Yeah, I'm in teacherly yeah. mode. Yeah. Yeah. But what is it that occasions you asking me this? I mean, what do I want to achieve? Because evidently you don't think I'm achieving whatever it is that you might credit me for <laughs> wanting to achieve. You don't see me as achieving it. And if what no. I want to achieve is the limelight, I'm getting plenty of that. <laughs> then, then success. I mean, I just, I see that you care about, I think you care about this, you know, this, I'm going to just, I think I can speak, you know, loosely and unpolitically correctly with your listeners. Like you, I see that you care about this critique of wokeness, right. Or, or the critiques that you make, like you care about them. Yes. Um, and so theoretically, and yet like, it's just this kind of like tug of war thing happening. This just, you know, um, or I like, if anything, it's like the critique is backfiring. It's like you're getting more and more celebrated by your tribe and more and more, you know, ears closed from the other tribe, maybe. So whereas, you know, um, there's all kinds of insights yeah, um, I mean, maybe it would help to get really specific. Um, yeah, I think it would. Like maybe we can hear. So maybe I can just like, I can take a specific issue and just kind of lay out what I see as an opportunity. Um, and then, and then we'll see what you think. And I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take the question of affirmative action. And I, <laughs> I know you've changed your mind on this many times. I, I think right now you, you oppose it. I think. <laughs> um, okay. I am not I mean, an expert. What? I said I could say more than simply yes okay. or no, but, but I, yeah, I oppose yeah, it. Uh, then, then, I'm, you know. I'm going to simplify, but really for purposes of yeah. kind of modeling a way of thinking or a way of going about a conversation that might move the zeitgeist, if that's what we're interested in doing. So, um, so let's just for a moment park the enormous question of whether, <laughs> again, I, yeah, I, I'm not an expert. I'm just, this is like for purposes of illustrating a way of thinking, but let's just park for the moment, the enormous question of whether Black people are not achieving the highest levels of, you know, academic excellence because of issues having to do with their character, culture, the, the interior versus poverty, historic oppression, you know, the, the system. Let's just park that for a second. Um, let's assume it's some of both, right? Like nature and nurture. Um, for some individuals, there's more one than the other, but let's just assume for now that there's like some interior stuff going on. There's some exterior stuff going on. We don't need to fight about it right now. Um, and that um, it's not only that there's some of both going on, that those things affect each other. There are things you can change, do to change the system that changes the culture that, right? So there's some feedback here. So, but let's just park that for a second. Okay, so people who are pro-affirmative action would say, you know, like, I don't, I don't know what the argument, like give them a leg up at, you know, these like the, the top tier academic institutions. And you would say, something like, oh, but that, you know, that would degrade academic excellence at these top tier academic institutions. And then they would, and then they're offended. You know, how can you say that? <laughs> and so, and I would say, you know, the question isn't whether it degrades academic excellence. It, it does a little. The, the question is whether that is a cost that we are willing to bear temporarily for the benefit of 
what we're trying to achieve, which then of course begs the question, what are we actually trying to achieve? Um, what, 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 is, what is the future we're trying to move towards that would then help us decide whether affirmative action is a helpful way to get there? Um, and maybe actually, maybe I'll just, I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes and then, and then I'll let you respond. I mean, what we're trying to achieve, the way that I would articulate that, just because I, I should, um, is like, it's not like what equality would look like is not, it wouldn't be this like control thrived flat, like my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn, first a woman, then a man, first a wife, then a flat. Like it would be much more dynamic. It would be much more alive. It would be much more like a flock of birds. It's like whoever needs to lead the flock leads the flock for whatever it is that we're trying to do. It's more of like a swarm intelligence kind of a thing. But for many reasons, including both the exterior stuff and the interior stuff, a lot of birds are just not equipped to lead the flock right now. And it would behoove all of us to have more birds, more prepared <laughs> to lead the flock. And so therefore, we may have to start with this like more flat contrived thing that like none of us, are, a lot of us are not particularly excited about in order to get to the more emergent, dynamic, alive place. Like we use affirmative action so that we don't have to use it anymore, if that makes sense. Like, and we can be explicit about that. Like, hey, y'all, you know, we're going to have to get my turn, your turn about this for a second or, or, or only some people's turn for a second so that, you know, we can get to a place where we don't need to do that. So then the question becomes, when do we not need it anymore? When under what circumstances does the flat thing start to inhibit the emergent thing? But that is a much different question than whether affirmative action degrades academic excellence or not. You know, like there's a yes and move here. And that move is like, and that might actually reflect why you've gone back and forth on this question of affirmative action, because there's a yes and there's a little bit of an all of the above going on here. Like, yes, it degrades academic or yes, whatever your critique is. And also it may be worth a temporary cost in order to get to the a place we want to go where we don't need it anymore. D does that make yeah. sense? No, I don't think it's right. I mean, it makes sense in the sense that it's sensible. I understand what you're saying and it's plausible, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's right. Or maybe I want to say, I don't think it's any longer right. I think it was right circa 1980, 1990, but it's not right circa 2030, 2040. And that that's the that's the thing. I mean, the way I've been putting it, you say, what's the goal? So I want to put equal dignity, equal respect is the goal. I, I don't think equal numerical uh, proportional representation should be the goal. Um, I think people and groups are different and they're not going to be as prominently represented in the physics department, in the music department, in the professional sports arena, in the investment banking world, in literature, in academics, uh, as uh, skilled craftsmen, uh, and women, and so forth. I think that that's a, a proxy for the supposition that in the absence of some kind of morally problematic institutional behavior, there would have been equal representation. I think that's simply a false claim. That claim is false. It's a historical relic of the fact that for a long time, there was systemic and structural uh, uh, limitation on the participation. And we carry that forward. And so 1950, 1960, 1970, that might have been a plausible claim. 2020, 2030, 2040, it's no longer really a plausible claim. What we're dealing with here for whatever the historical reasons, and there are many falling on all sides of the aisle, is the failure of African-American people taken broadly to realize our full human potential. That's what I think is happening. And I think if equal dignity, not equal proportional representation, but a sense of equal buy-in earned in status and engagement in whatever the enterprise is, is the goal, then affirmative action has become an impediment to achieving that goal. Uh, and and it's, it's insidious in its, I mean, it's not just a degradation of standards. 
It's a corruption of our very criteria of assessment in a, in a, a, a racialized. It's racialized. This is a very insidious thing. Um, the black is invited to be skeptical about the challenge that everybody has to face of actually earning their place and earning their spurs and proving their worth. Uh, you can't ask that question. You don't want to get rid of the test? This is a disaster. Right, but it, Glenn, are, are you noticing that like a lo- your critique is, a lot of it is, um, it's, I don't know what to call, it's like almost like rhetorical. It's al- It's like less strategic than it is because... Because what we should really just care about is like, is it helpful in getting us to where we want to go? Like, well, even said, if it does all of these horrible things, you know, it does the cost outweigh the benefit, you know, like it can, it can be an anathema to our, you know, our, our sense of, of, I, I don't remember what words you just used, you know, the, the way that we measure, um, it can be, you know, and it can still be temporarily helpful. And I'm not going to, well, I don't want to. use this word temporarily and we're 50 years in. There's no um, sign of anything yeah. going away. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Um, and again, I, I'm not enough of an expert to speak on this. It's more of a way of, of thinking about, it's more of like sh- <laughs> being right to being helpful. Is like, is it helpful? Is it helping us get to do, do the thing that we're trying to really kind of keep our eyes on the, Goal. So what do you think about my definition of the goal, which is equal dignity, which is, I'm afraid, being undermined by the use of different standards? Yeah, that sounds like a, I don't, to me, that sounds like something. You theoretical or rhetorical. Well, no, it sounds like maybe it's a more, it's a fear that's, that's like really personal to you. Really? So that echoes something in our conversation about uh, the enemy within, you know, the enemy within. Black society, unwed motherhood, too much violence, school failure, behavior, behavior, <laughs> culture, and the enemy within Glenn Lowry. All uh, those things. You know, unrestrained <laughs> uh, sexual, you know, yeah. adventurous, adventurer and, you know. And this uh, is true for affirmative action, too. Obviously, of course. Right. I mean, that well, was part you of your story. Oh, you mean coming along? Affirmative did action? I get affirmative action at Harvard and all that kind of stuff? I mean, at least didn't you? Didn't it for MIT? I don't remember if they're after. Uh, but. You know, I mean, I like to tell myself I was this, you know, superstar undergrad. That at it can also be true. They can be true simultaneously. Oh. <laughs> it's true. They could both be true. And what can you say? I think if you're a black person, you have to kind of let that one roll off your back a little bit. I mean. You certainly don't want to be the guy that said, I didn't get a fair match. You know, you don't yeah. want to be that guy. But you I mean, also I, don't want to be, you know, I earned what I got. I'm, you know, as good as I, you know, the next, you know, whatever, which is certainly the attitude that I carry around within myself, you know. Yeah. Like, I think, I think adding under what circumstances to the beginning of a, question or an idea it's like it's not we don't need to decide whether affirmative action writ large forever is right or wrong the question is under what circumstances can it help us achieve xyz but you're not under what circumstances if any if any and you might say "Hmm, you're not addressing my concern that we've been at this for a long time and it's becoming institutionalized and the diversity equity and inclusion language and the anti-racism, critical race theoretic, you know, kind of racial that, reckoning that, that's sensibility. Fine. You, you might be totally right. But then I would say in order to be helpful as part of your participation in the public discourse, I, 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 I would, I would, um, yeah, I would, I would communicate in terms of not like affirmative action is right or wrong writ large, but I would, it, like you are doing a fabulous job, let's say, of articulating the circumstances in which it does not work. And maybe those circumstances are everything, but maybe there are some in there. But like the, you know, so when, when I, like when I hear someone say like something is wrong or something is no, it's like, well, thank you for identifying the circumstances in which it doesn't work. 
there might be some in which it, I mean, this fight about masks and vaccines and ivermectin and all of this, it's all, it's all just identifying the circumstances in which things work or don't. But instead we're framing it as like, yes or no, you know, and that, and not just, yeah. Well, this is a very general point, right? Not just about affirmative action or about yes, public but I'm, I'm, policy. Yes, exactly. This is really a pragmatics versus principle. Yes. And like you say, it's team play. Are we trying to solve a problem or are we like at on opposite sides of the gym with our different yes. colored uniforms on? Exactly. So helpful <laughs> is pragmatic. Right is principled. And there's a place for that. Of course, always principles, of course our greatest no, philosophers. But if you, think, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of when I used to be a Christian and <sighs> there was about evangelism, you know, about whether or not, because I mean, you know that Jesus is Lord, that he's given the Christ is, you know, the vehicle to connect you with uh, the God and everlasting life and he's alive. And you know this, this is good news. And uh, do you, do you like stand on it? I mean, or do you, they would call it deny your faith. The compromise that you're talking about would be a considered of a like denying of saying what it is that you're true on behalf of these worldly, you know, uh, craven kind of uh, common, you know, value. You know, uh, it, you're placating. You're 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 splitting the difference with you know, and the purity because there's a kind of real. Uh, sense of wholeness sometimes in that purity, you know, because if you've got the truth, goodness, I mean, that's really liberating, you know? Yeah. And we do need that in order to, I, I absolutely, in order to kind of like keep ourselves within the boundaries of, you know, I don't know, the, the true, the good and the beautiful. Like we need to put some stakes in the ground somewhere, obviously, to keep ourselves within some kind of bounds. But yeah, then like we're trying to get something done here. <laughs> um, but doesn't it I'm, depend on what the question is? Well, actually, I'm going to give you another example. And this this is like, this is kind of like, this is, this is, this is, we'll see where this goes. I haven't really Uh-oh. talked about this publicly, but so even just, you know, the notion that racism is real, but race is not, right? So ra- race is not real. And 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 the beauty of this kind of thinking is that we don't even have to decide. We don't even have to choose whether race is real or not. Instead of asking, is it real or not? We can just ask, under what circumstances, if any, is it helpful to think that it's real versus helpful to think that it's not real? Like, it's really helpful to think that race is not real for purposes of the work that Chloe Valdry does. Right. She's doing incredible her theory of enchantment, you know, like let's do away with all this essentializing of people and just like get to our common shared humanity. Meanwhile, perhaps it can sometimes be helpful to treat race as real for purposes of ensuring equal (coughs) dignity and equal. I forget how you defined it, equal dignity and equal respect. Um, and so I think, you know, and th- this might be, I don't know, blasphemous for some of the, you know, the listeners, but like we can actually be less empirical sometimes and just more strategic about even just the concepts that we use, even what we consider as real or true. The strategy um, is being applied to how we frame whatever the question is. And the strategic goal would be to frame it so as to be most useful in terms of solving a problem or ameliorating the condition or achieving the the goal. Yeah, because the way we talk about that, we're not just talking about, you know, reality. We are actively shaping at a high enough level of influence, especially, and I would put you there. You are not just talking about reality. You're actively shaping it. So, yeah. And this is also, I would also say this, this too is kind of like, is kind of, I don't know, temporary or of this moment, like this focus of mine right now here with us on strategy, like that's just kind of because that's, that's what this moment feels like it calls for. But I think that too will change, you know, maybe we'll go overboard and then we'll need to go back to principles again. We probably will. You know, but I, but I, I think that's just kind of what is called for in this moment. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to 
articulate a contrary view. Okay, of course. Okay, because my, <laughs> my, beat, is, my beat is race. My beat is race. We talked okay. about affirmative action, talked about is race real and how do you think about it? And, and that's my beat. And I said I was concerned about the well-being of my people, quote unquote. And that's my story to some degree, you know, Chicago and all of that. You know, I've been black all my life. I'm with the black guys and black kids, me and John <laughs> McWhorter, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So I'm a race guy. I do. That's what I do. That's my professional identity, you know, that's, you know. And the clock is ticking, you know? Stephanie, I don't know. I'm I, I <laughs> seldom at a loss for words, but I kind of <laughs> don't really know what I want to say. N- knowing that the clock is ticking I makes know. you want to what? It, it's, yeah. I sense a looming disaster and I'm, you know... <sighs> So it's crying out in the wilderness. And, uh, I don't know if I even really want to be honest, not only with you, but with myself about it. Well, it sounds like you're already thinking it. I am ashamed. I'm deeply ashamed. People will tell me that this is irrational. So my people, I'm talking about African-Americans, have now fallen into this pathetic posture. Um, In the face of the fast-moving world, the world is just being transformed. In my lifetime, I mean, India and China, they're completely different things now than they were when I was in college coming up in the 60s and the 70s. I mean, it's... The world is small. I have, I'm, I'm working with Nikita. Nikita is my guy, you know, my creative director at the yeah. show podcast. What about, he's in St. Petersburg or actually now, no, I'm not going to say where he is because he's Nikita. He's my man. Uh huh. I've never been in the same room with him, Stephanie. Hmm. And yet we're, we're building a business together. Mm-hmm. The world is small. Everything is changing. These devices that we have, the information that's available, everything is changing. The country is changing. Tens of millions of immigrants, the Chinatowns all over the world, the Latino dynamic that's going on in these parts of the country. And Chicago, the city of Chicago is like, you know, down to a third black or 30% or whatever. It's going to be a, a Latino city before you look, know it, you know, or a very substantial. And in the Southwest and everything like that. I don't know. So you look at the failure in society. You look at the jails that are overflowing. You look at the centers. I could go on. I could go on. Okay. You look at the black family. It's a complete disarray. People will argue me theoretical arguments that you'll tell me not to draw too tightly because there's probably a middle ground somewhere that we can agree. <laughs> and, but, but I, you know, and, and this affirmative action stuff and this stuff about standards in the intellectual arenas of, of competition and whatnot. I mean, it's just one more indication of it. The politics of it's a wine. It's all a pathetic self prostration before a jury that you've already condemned as racist. It's, you know, we're going to end up looking like the Roma, uh, the 30% or 40% of African-American society that is in one way or another uh, failing to engage and to connect and to, and to be able to stand on its own two feet. Wards of the state uh, are objects of pity and contempt and concealed contempt. This whole game that we play about racism, anti-racism, fragility, uh, and whatnot, we're going to excise the, the working class Staten Island dwelling or South Carolina dwelling uh, or, or Trump voting uh, Louisiana 
uh, you know, they, we're going to give them the back of our hand. We're going to write them off as yahoos. The people who see that affirmative action, the, the ones who think, and some of them are sitting in private high-end schools in New York City who didn't get into the Ivies because even though they're better, quote unquote, than the black kid down the way that, et cetera, et cetera. The, the hypocrisy, the, the lying, the excuse making, the, the, you know. So I have nothing but contempt for it. Um, and uh, my raison d'etre is to, as effectively as I can, give voice to that contempt, uh, as incisively, um, uh, as uh, it, in, in such a memorable fashion, to etch it into stone, that contempt. I mean, if that's what you want to do, then yeah. I mean, you're doing a great job. <laughs> you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but is there not a role for that? I mean, everybody course, doesn't have to but, be but Mother Teresa. And no, she, no, Mother no, Teresa no, no, wasn't no. Mother Teresa. By the no, way. no, no. Of course. I mean, but that's also, I mean, sure. Of course. Yeah. All of the, but you know, and it's also like, what is your role here? And, um, I, you know, my, my orientation is, you know, I'm, yeah, this is why I really admire Chloe, Chloe Valder, you know, it's her, her, I think it's her first her second, her second principle is criticize to uplift. It's not don't criticize. It's criticize in service of what, for purposes of what, right? There's a difference between like canceling or, or so, and then like tough love. Like I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm criticizing you because I believe in you because I believe in your capacity to grow. So there, it's of course there's a role for critique. It's but if, just if, what if is I it were, serving? If, if I were an artist in in whatever the medium, I'm a painter. Mm. Would my painting have to be in the service of uplift or affirmation of something? What what, what about Only, giving uh, what about giving a representation of some of the I don't know dark corners of the human spirit? Or whatever. I'm. I'm just imagining. I'm making this up, but I'm just saying. An artist. You wouldn't. You wouldn't put him in the service or her. No, of, I would not. Of, but of Glenn, a program. Here, here's the difference I would make between an artist and where you're at. Again, at a certain level of influence, you are no longer just talking about reality. Your paintings are influencing reality. So, at a certain level of influence, you actually have to take responsibility. You can, you, if you, if you can choose to, you know, like I'm so, sometimes I'm amused when I hear like, you know, I mean, I'll give an example, you know, I like the conversation between Ezra Klein and Fiona Hill about Russia and Fiona Hill is like, oh, you know, he's asking her about to kind of talk about what she thinks about what's going to happen, you know, paint different scenarios. And, and she's hesitant. She's like, well, I don't really want to talk about scenarios because I don't want to lead us in that direction. It's like, you're already leading us. You are already leading us. It, the difference is like whether you are taking responsibility for where you are leading us, but we are being led right now. So, and that's, you know, that's something maybe you didn't ask for, but this is, this is the moment we're in. It's no longer, you know, it's no longer just the gatekeeper. It's no longer Walter Cronkite, whatever. We're in a moment of just, you know, whoever's got the influence is shaping the reality we're all swimming in. So... Um, yeah. Um, I, I mean, once upon a time you could paint whatever paintings you want. And now you just, I would say you, 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 <laughs> you at the, at your level of influence, it's, it's, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to be so hard on you. I don't know if I, no, it's okay. Because there's, I a, feel... there's a bigger responsibility. One could say, one could make that case. Uh, and, and I, I, and I mean, actually, the the more important thing maybe is if you're so concerned, if you're so scared, you know, if you're concerned about where we're heading, yeah, well, then all the more reason to, you know, to 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 leverage your influence, the, the more reason to get curious about, you know, how to use your influence to move us in a in a fruitful direction, what you consider to be a fruitful direction. 
Yeah, I mean, I've got a trivial thought in my head, something about I just want to speak my truth and let the chips fall where they may. I don't think I'm not that clever. I don't know how the bank shot works. If you're okay, well, the then third here, order here's effect a, or something. Here's a question. Something here's a say. question, Glenn. When you say speak your truth, are you, do you feel like you're still having revelations about new things that you're, that you're wanting to express? Actually, I, I do. I don't want to overstate it. I, I, I feel my worldview coming into focus a little bit as the years go by. And, I, I, you know, certain things are still, you know, unresolved and like religion, you know. Mm. Um, but, you know, capitalism, you know, I'm, I'm pretty clearly a, a neoliberal. I'm dug in. Okay. I mean, I, you know, et cetera. Um, Voter suppression, again, I think uh, minorities are being led around by the nose that it's a trope. <laughs> I'll get into such trouble uh, that, that it's, it's a, a mantra, that it's a device, uh, that the real, quote unquote, the real threats to democracy, you know, January 6th and all of that. And <laughs> is that if I go on, uh, I will get into trouble. And, it, and I'm not on a soapbox about it, but I just think I feel myself being manipulated by uh of forces that are uh you know Im- impervious in a way and i you know and i i don't i so maybe what i'm saying is i don't think the people on the other side of most of the debates and i'm not debating about january 6th or anything like that but but the things that i am debating about I don't think they're sincere. I, I, I don't think they're persuadable. I mean, I, I think that uh, I actually enjoy the conflict. Yeah. Well, I wonder if there's a way to continue. I mean, I, yeah, enjoying the conflict. Um, you know, in a way that, I don't know. I also don't want to be in the business of like, I, like I'm not like trying to change you or it's, you not. know. <laughs> but, you, um, you're, but you're concerned and you said you care. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, con- yeah, when I, I mean, I, well, and you're saying, you're, you're saying now that you feel like your worldview is still coming into focus and there are some things that are still not yet resolved. And um, yeah. are you familiar with integral theory? <laughs> no, I'm not. Has anyone talked to you about Ken Wilber? I think John McWhorter is familiar with Weber? Ken Wilber's work. Wilbur, Ken Wilber. Wilbur. Um, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Well, it's, 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 it's a, an area I have, um, that's, that's, I mean, I, I used to call myself a promiscuous pragmatic pluralist <laughs> until I did discovered that there was actually like a field of philosophy that, that, um, you know, that there was one word for it integral, which is much less of a mouthful. So anyway, this is in the early two thousands that I discovered integral thinking and, but I mean, and I don't need to kind of lay lay too much of it out. It's it's so the orientation of integral is um is what I was saying earlier. It's like instead of thinking of like x is right, y is wrong, it's like well, what if x and y both have some degree of rightness, even though perhaps x is more right than y. And so instead of, you know, which one is right, it's like under what circumstances is which one right or which one helpful or which one useful. It's like you move to a higher dimension. Yes, exactly. So it's actually called integral meta theory because it integrates different theories. It integrates and the strongest version, right? It integrates the, let's say like the steel man version of each perspective in order to create a more holistic perspective that more people can get on board with. I'm going to show you a thread I've been playing with. I'm just curious how this... So I've been playing with um, Venn diagrams to... Um, Do I need to make you co-host if you want to share your screen? Oh, no, you can just look at it. You, I don't need to okay. share. You can just bring it up and... 
Um, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's it's very simple. It's just taking the strongest arguments on different sides of an issue, whether it's abortion or free speech or whatever it is, oh. and putting them in the different circles of a Venn diagram and saying like, we can actually, you know, we can actually be, you know, it's like, what is the position that the biggest ideological diversity of people could get on board with? What is that position? Let's find that position. Let's make that position. And yeah, then, and then, yeah. and then the conflict that, that you're doing again is doing the really important work, right? Of like articulating the bounds of, 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 of one of these or whatever, you know, it's like affirmative action doesn't work here. Great. Okay. So we leave that off the Venn diagram. Cause that's, that's the weak part of it. That's the, or that's the, the thing that doesn't work. We're trying to integrate all the things that do work. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. I don't mean peripherally, you know, nah. I, I see the diagram and I see what you mean about the intersection. And I can see kind of like even the mathematics of it. You got vector going in this direction, vector going in this direction. You can kind of draw on both to a certain degree and you could go in the other direction and that'll be closer to your goal. Kind of thing like that. I see that. He, he, okay, and here's the, here's for you, Glenn, what I would say is the like, um, Opportunity. Okay. The opportunity for you, I would say like, no need to let go of the conflict. No need to let go of the telling your truth. Like you're still having revelations. Of course you want to express them. Who would not? Right. And these revelations are important. Maybe there's something though around. um, Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to like doing it with the bigger picture in mind or doing it with the bigger frame in mind or I just want to push back. I, I just want okay. to okay. So, okay, we talked about race <laughs> and affirmative action. Yeah. So I recently uh, got a notice from my university uh, newspaper that uh, an assistant dean in the graduate school was being appointed for diversity and inclusion affairs to interface with graduate students of color, BIPOC graduate students, on behalf of inclusion and diversity at EDRA. And as I read the story, I learned that the assistant dean for graduate school students of color was reporting to a dean of the, or associate dean of the graduate school on behalf of uh, diversity and inclusion goals at Brown. And in the bowels of the story, it was related that the graduate school's associate dean I should say, associate dean reported to an associate provost for diversity and inclusion at Brown. So I've got three layers of uh, bureaucratic oversight on behalf of the goals of diversity and inclusion at Brown. Now, I think students of color do come to Brown to go to graduate school in a variety of fields from, you know, we could name the fields. Perhaps they do need an interface. But I'm looking at a dug-in, professionalized, entrenched structure of, on behalf of administering to the identity needs of students of color who come to Brown to matriculate. There's a university-wide plan. There are, there are scores of people whose livings are dependent upon this. Is that Brown? Yeah. Now, now we're talking about affirmative action. And, and I think, okay, this puts it too sharply. This puts it a little too sharply. The whole thing is just completely bogus. It's, it's, it's a, a sandcastle is what I think. Uh, I, I think it's deeply wrong here. You say, don't just get rid of affirmative action. When does it work and when does it doesn't work? Come on. The, the, so, um, does it need to be rooted out, root and branch? It won't be. It, it can't be. Uh, well, 
I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I didn't get to a conclusion. The conclusion, I think, is I'm not interested in compromising. I mean, I'm, I'm not really. This is the wrong vision that we've well, got here. I'm interested yeah. in being clear about a contrary vision. Maybe totally. in the fullness of time, maybe after generations have passed, the clarity will be uh, will be there for people to, to see. I, I, I just don't want to compromise with the system. No, no, and you you don't have to, and I hope it's not. I hope it do, it's not. I don't know. I hope it doesn't offend you that that, that then I, my my the way I see what you're doing then is identifying the circumstances in which something does not work. You know, I, that that that's like from my vantage point, but. Oh, I think and, there's, and as opposed to solving the problem. No, no, it's really important to know. Uh, uh-uh, uh, I think we would be so much. Again, I think if we had had our conversation about COVID, it's like, again, the people who are anti-mask or anti this or anti that are identifying the circumstances in which we should not use these things, which is really important. It's like kids, people who are immunocompromised, whatever. It's like. Thank you for identifying the circumstances in which we should not do this thing. That is really critical boundary work. It's not all or nothing. Like you are, you, we can, we, we could call you like a boundary identifier. But, but the thing is like, you, maybe you frame it as like an, as an all or nothing proposition, or we frame it as an all or nothing proposition, which is where we get into trouble. I mean, I, yeah, I, but, but just to take a step back, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the saying, evolution is beautiful, but it's not pretty. <laughs> I've never heard that. I've never okay. heard that. So it's beautiful, but it's not pretty. It's messy. It's messy. I mean, just think about, just to take a, another example of um, cultural evolution, just think of the whole Me Too situation. It's like, yeah, there's an entire generation of young boys who are whatever getting like over accused and having an awkward so whatever whatever yeah. whatever insert whatever you need to insert there and we're evolving in a really important way <laughs> you know so evolution is beautiful but it's not pretty would it be could we make it prettier we probably could but that would also require us to drag ourselves through the mud a little bit less and just be like hey we're going through something hey they're kids you know like like literally, and my daughter, she's five. She was going through, she was having a lot of tantrums recently. And I talked to, and you know, it's like parents will give you like theories and frameworks and books. I talked to a 13 year old who was like, oh yeah, she's going through a phase. I was like, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. A 13 year old told me the wisest thing out of everybody else. <laughs> That's pretty good. beautiful but it's not pretty <clears throat> yeah <clears throat> okay so we could think about some changes and this issue about race and inclusion is one of them and clearly there needed to be change and uh we're moving toward a more diverse world and there are going to be some rough patches along the way but at the end of the day uh we we will have evolved into something more beautiful. Is Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the intention. I mean, that's what we have done in the past. Um, and I think we could learn, I mean, just like I th- we are becoming more aware of our own process of evolution, of cultural evolution. And I think that can take the edge off a little bit. Because we can be like, oh, <laughs> we're evolving. We've done this a couple times. I know what's going on. You know, I've seen this before. Um, but when on did the we race, do it before? When did we do it before? Yeah. Uh, with, I mean, we've done it with sexuality. Right now we're in a whole thing about it with gender. <laughs> but um, I mean, we're still, we're still in a thing about it with sexuality. But homosexuality, we've done it. Do you think that our ideas, and I'm talking about in the enlightened West, <laughs> North, Northern Europe, North America, Australia. I don't know that, I mean, let me just ask the question. Are more advanced 
is is like a measurable in some direction of progress, better better society than um, the Islamic world and then uh, sub-Saharan African societies of one stripe or another, they are very, very different among themselves. Uh, then South and Southeast Asia, and I, again, don't know very much about these places, but I can imagine in their enormous complexity of, uh, you know, social judgment and practice, uh, they, they differ from ourselves. The, the question, I mean, it's a rhetorical question. Can you, we say something is better? Yeah. You do think so. Is that is that your question? Can we say that something is better in some I don't kind mean of it in an absolute sense? I mean, for example, with respect to sexuality, and yeah. with respect to gender. I mean, yeah, I, I, you're, I, I'm gonna call myself out as a. I do, yeah, I do believe that culture and consciousness are evolving, um, and. Um, I asked you about but, the West versus the the West. Yeah, the, well, it's it's um. There's so much to say about this question, Glenn, and I'm if if this is yeah, I I I'm. <laughs> there's so much to say. What, but what about the loss of religion? I'll say I'll say this. I'll say a nine year old is not a defective twelve year old. First of all, um, and um, a twelve year old is also capable of more of a more complex, you know, understanding and embrace of, 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 of the world. Well, um, but, but what I'm saying it, is that it's a particular cultural feature of our time and place that, and this is about age and, and parenting and whatnot, but also about gender and about sexuality. Uh, these things have been around in human culture for eons. The, the 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 um evolution that you were celebrating is beautiful in terms of social norm uh including the the death of god secularization and, and whatnot uh, equality gender equality between men and women gender identity g- fluidity bipolarity all this kind of so oh, here here's the here's the uh, here's the re- so once upon a time let's say um we had a way of doing things and we were like, this is the right way. And every other way is wrong. And this way is right. And then the circumstances changed. And we were, and we, and so we changed our way of doing things. We were like, no, 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 this way. This is the right way of doing things. All the other ways are wrong this way. And then it happened again and again. And we were like, and we were like, wait, we're we're noticing a pattern here. Our, maybe, maybe the way that we're doing things now is not the right and the only right way to do things. Maybe. The, thank God we've given birth to so many ways of doing things. Some ways are better than others. Some ways are more just than others. Some ways are more fun than others. Some ways are more delightful than others. But like, thank God we have so many of them because we're going to go through all kinds of circumstances. And sometimes we're going to need to shift into emergency asshole mode, right? In order to get ourselves through the crisis. So so the, the shift, this sounds the big like shift. A, a promiscuous <laughs> Pragmatic, it's pragmatic pluralism. Pluralist. Yeah, I mean that's but the big <laughs> shift. The big shift is in 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 that realization. In oh wait, what if it's not that my way is right and all other ways are wrong? What if and it's not relativism okay, but either. This is a different answer to my question. My question was: Do you think that our norms uh, re- recently arrived at regarding things like uh, gender and sexuality? our norms, that is, norms of North America, Northern Europe, and so forth, vis-a-vis the rest of the world, were in advance. And yes, you, but we include and transcend. That there are many different ways, including there are many yeah. different ways of dealing with but in, gender but in and adopting, sexuality. in adopting those new norms, we also negated the other thing. We were like, this one's right and that one is wrong, right? We, well, we lost God. We lost well, you, the you enchantment. You can't have it of, both ways that yes, you can. Ma- homosexual <laughs> marriage and there's not homosexual marriage. Wait, if, sorry, if, if what? people of the same sex can be married, that's one thing in the law. And if they can't, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can, ways. but you didn't have to lose God along the way. You can lose, you can, there's some things that are absolutely ex- worth losing. Slavery, we can let go of that. But there are other things that we, we threw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Partly because we were giving birth to this new thing and we needed a lot of space, let's say, to do that. But it's, t- yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's it's um, 
it's catching up with us, shall we say. Like we 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 need to bring, we can't lose, right? Um, I mean, we sh- we definitely can't lose God. <laughs> okay, this might this might be a little bit of a sophistry, but I'm going to say I think your pragmatic pluralism is is incoherent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it is itself a principle and it has no defense of its own principality, its own principleness, because it is relativistic. Uh, we don't want to say anything is right. And yet it is a way no, 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 of but approaching I'm not the saying world. That. I'm not saying that some things are absolutely more right than others, for sure. Oh, but there's for a little sure. bit of rightness in everything. Um, no, I just said slavery has no rightness. So there are some things that that. So the term that is used in this feel is transcend and include which we, okay. we leave behind the things that didn't work about this thing but we keep the things that did right so there's there's some things that have no rightness whatsoever does that mean did we need to go through them in order to, to get to here i don't know that i don't I, know i don't know and i think but, we're getting to the heart of why it is that <laughs> I, did, I didn't like what you were trying to tell me about my concerns oh. and sexuality and gender are not my concerns uh-huh but 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 uh, there, I know people, uh, I correspond with a guy and he's very, very concerned about uh, the transgender rights movement. He thinks it's the, he thinks it's the beginning of the end of civilization. Okay. That puts it in a very extreme way. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm not taking that position at all. Not, not at all, but I'm saying that that the advent of that relativization of such that <laughs> a Supreme Court uh, justice can't say what is a woman, you know, <laughs> such that talking about mothers is, is, is somehow problematic and you have to say birthing person and so on. I, I don't want to make fun of this, okay? I'm, I'm not trying to score a point. I'm, I'm trying to say you can't just come up on a society as it were, almost out of the blue, we're talking about 25 years, and then declare that the um, overturning of certain uh, conventional arrangements is, is an enlightenment without an argument, without a, without a deeper account of the normative judgment, this, this kind of liberatory letting everyone be themselves. I mean, that's not... That's just not good enough for me as an argument. And it sounds like bandwagon writing, the waves crest this way and that of popular sentiment about whatever they may have taken the issues to be. Racial justice is one of those bandwagon effects of our time. And then, and then people will feel virtuous about riding the wave up, riding the wave as, as opposed, and, and they will abdicate their, uh, you say, you talk about responsibility. Their responsibility to see clearly, their, their, their responsibility to have <coughs> um, so in, anyway, I, I, so I'm exposing myself. Uh, the the um, resolution of this uh, issue about uh, gender identity, it strikes me is is far, far from it's far from clear. I mean, is it, is it so far from slavery? I, I, I don't even know what to say. I mean, um, I mean, I, is it is it okay for me to have any feeling about my twelve year old? You say a twelve year old is not a nine year old, but what? Suppose a twelve year old wants to start hormone therapy. Is it okay for me to have any sense of, um, you know, what a dilemma? Uh, it's you know. Anyway, I, I stop only because I don't know exactly what I want to say about this, except uh, <coughs> um, let her go and have the breast removal su- uh, surgery is not one of the things that I want to say. Yeah. I mean, I th- again, I would say evolution is beautiful, but it's not pretty. And I think <laughs> if anything, the back the backlash is almost like making it worse. Like I, that's, you know, like we need room to kind of like work this out a little bit. And that doesn't- But you put Thomas in our our face. You you being- Room room to work it out does not mean let 12 year olds do hormone therapy. It does not mean teach, teach, I don't know what to kids that are too young to learn that. 
but it means it means like whatever creating a safe and responsible way to like grow in this in this way that we're trying to go because guess what it does take a village and guess what villages can look in all kinds of ways you know like i have two yeah. young kids if i didn't live near my parents i would really want some other i don't know constellation of like one of my colleagues he's the leader of the asexuality movement okay so he and what he wanted is he instead of wanting um to be in like a polyamorous situation and not have kids he wants the opposite of that he wants no sex and just the kids so he's the third parent to a couple like i want i want someone like that in my life like to me it's like how how may there's so many constellations there's so many ways that this can look and work i never heard that idea before what do and you call it again and we need all the help we can asexual get asexual parenting is that what you call it <laughs> he he's the leader of the asexuality movement and he's the parent to a couple asexuality. he's the third the third parent and so it's like there's there's a new functional nuclear situation that's like really working for everyone like how much how much easier is it for these parents who have a third parent you know it's and yeah, so I, I'm not against that I, and I see what you mean It's like there's all kinds of ways that yeah, this can that look and work and function and so and and you know and I think the more that we fight <laughs> the more that we fight like yeah. the 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 harder more painful like I mean, yeah, the, we, we, I was going to say the more painful it will be to get there. Like we may not even make it. <laughs> we may not make it because we will have, you know, destroyed our, you know, ourselves in the process. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we need to try uh, to come to a close. Yeah. Think. Yeah. We should come to a close. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask if you want to talk about your marriage, but I don't think that's, <laughs> I don't think that's really, <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll be the next round. Um, oh, well, I mean, not to put that on people and then just uh, not, not <laughs> I mean, what <laughs> Stephanie is referring to is I allowed as how, and people who follow the Glenn show know that my lovely wife, Lawan, who has appeared in cameo over the shoulder camera shots at the Glenn show in the past, but has not actually been a guest on the Glenn show yet. We're thinking about maybe trying to do that and have a conversation about whatever, reading the newspaper together in the morning kind of thing and shooting the stuff about uh, whatever is going on in politics and, and in the world. And in that way, giving voice to our different orientations and whatnot and kind of sharing some of the tension and uh, joy in effect of that kind of, uh, you know, uh, banter back and forth. Oh, you must be crazy. Come on. That's not like, oh, yes, it is. Let me tell you why. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> she's a, she's a, a Bernie uh, Sanders supporting progressive. She wouldn't call herself a Democrat. If I called her a Democrat, she'd have a fit. She's mm. a progressive. The Democrats, the, the corporate Democrats, the, the do-nothing Democrats, you know, uh, she would be very upset with. Uh, but we, we have different politics. Bottom line is we have different politics. Um, I am a, a used to be Christian, a, a lapsed Christian and whatnot. She is a, you know, atheist with a fair amount of uh, intensity and whatnot. We've had our differences about religion, not in the sense of, oh, believe this or don't believe that, but in the sense of those people over there who are practicing this thing, you know, either they are idiots and they believe in a magic being in the sky and, you know, kind of giving the back of your hand, or there are people trying to seek understanding and ways of various positions toward whom you should be more tolerant, et cetera. So we have these differences. Uh, but being right, this is Stephanie, <laughs> and being helpful, that, that, that contrast between being right and picking a, an argument and being on one side and one of your side to prevail and being helpful, which in the context of a marriage means the health of your relationship and the joy of your camaraderie together and your life together. And you pit these things against one another and it's not hard to figure out which one you really want. If you're married, you want helpful, you want nurture of the joy of the com combination of lives together that are being shared at a very deep level. You don't want to win an argument at the expense of your relationship, etc. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a rich a target-rich environment for Stephanie yeah. Lepp to come up with her various holistic, integral <laughs> theories of uh, human psychology. 
Well, that, yeah, well, maybe this will be a good, um, yeah, good segue to a conversation with, with your wife then. Yeah. Maybe it will be. Stay tuned, Blend Show followers, because uh, we're in a very interesting space right now with Stephanie. So we're going to sign off. Hey, Stephanie. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> Thank you.